you are an entrepreneur, a professional, a speaker, or a coach, and although you've come a long way, it's time for you to take it to the next level. We've got you. This is the Author to Authority Podcast. We'll help you use authority and influencer marketing to build your business stronger and faster by publishing a book. You'll hear from guests that are thought leaders in sales, marketing, networking, communication, social media, promotion, and business leadership. Let's do it. This is the Author to Authority Podcast. And now your host, the extraordinary word ninja, Kim Thompson Pinder. Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. And today, if you are tired of having to do all of the sales in your business, I know I am. That's one of the reasons why I wanted Corey on the show. <laughs> uh, then you're going to enjoy today's conversation as we look at how do you break that? How how do you, you know, going from being the one who has to do all the sales to being able to trust other people to do it? So I think we're going to have a very good conversation today. I want to introduce Corey Quinn to you. He's the former CMO of Scorpion and now a dedicated agency coach. Corey specializes in helping agency founders scale revenue. At Scorpion, he played a pivotal role in growing the agency's revenue eight times. Yes, that is an eight in five years to a remarkable $150 million company. Corey is also the author of Anyone, Not Everyone, a comprehensive guide for agency founders looking to simplify growth and escape founder-led sales. Welcome to the show, Corey. Thank you, Kim. I'm excited to be here. So, Corey, I'm, I'm just really curious here because um, I want to just ask you the really obvious question, and that is, can you transition? You know, when when you're the small business or the solopreneur, the consultant, you know, the, the speaker, all these kinds of things, can you transition from having to do all the sales yourself to being able to have other people do it? Uh, you absolutely can, Kim. And many, many agencies that are successful and large you know, have done it. They've all started, most agencies have started with a one-person company hanging out a shingle. And eventually, you know, some of them, a lot of them become larger companies with, with many people. And sometimes agency founders stay in sales and sometimes they hire a whole sales team. I'll give you an example. My last agency I worked for in-house, the company Scorpion you mentioned in the intro, we started with a six-person sales team. But well, I should say, I joined the company when it was already operating and they had a six-person sales team. We grew the sales team to 100 people. Um, and this is for an agency. Yeah. <laughs> so it is possible. The challenge I think that a lot of agency owners have and consultants as they're scaling um, is that they're typically the most passionate person about the, their business, the, probably the most, and that, that enthusiasm is contagious in the sales conversation. They know the most about uh, the product and are able to communicate the value very, very succinctly in a, in a compelling way, which is why that they start in sales, obviously, but which is also why one of the reasons why they sort of get stuck there. There's a couple of other things that get, that get them stuck there, but it is always the, 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 the charismatic founder that, that is, where, is where sales start. It doesn't have to end there, though. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. And, and you are right. The the best person to sell your product is you, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, that's that's something I've I've thought about on this journey as I plan for you know the next stage of RTI publishing, is you know how how do I you know teach and train or you know how do I let go of some of these things because I am the most passionate about it. I am yeah. I created it. Out of nothing, I created it. This is my baby, my child. And so I completely hear you there. Mm -hmm. Corey, why did you decide to go from working at a company to starting your mm -hmm. own agency? So I so I've been an entrepreneur in my early days. I've graduated from college and I quickly came home and I started actually I started working in the restaurant industry because I wanted to make some money, but I really, my career really took off when I started 
a, a business back in 98, 1998, 1999, back when the internet was first emerging and it was this huge new technology that was rapidly being adopted. In any event, my best friend and I, we raised $6 million to launch a dot-com startup, as they used to call them. And so <laughs> that, that was an amazing experience. We, we ran the business for a couple of years. However, ultimately, I ended up going back into sort of a traditional career path. I went back to business school and I worked in finance and I worked at other companies. Yeah, you know, I eventually got married and had had you know a family. And as a result of that, you know, the gotta pay the bills. And so that was my path for a long time, but always wanting to get back to the entrepreneurial pursuit. The the sort of the the I had a taste early on and I wanted to get back to it. So that's that's one of the big reasons why. I think everyone's journey starts out with either working in a grocery store, a convenience yeah. store, or a restaurant. Yeah, right. I actually, my very first job was as as a bag boy in a, in a grocery store, and I worked in a ton of restaurants. And that you know, it's 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 a great place to work, and and it's it's a it's like you said, it's a place where a lot of people start. Yeah, I I don't know if you guys would have them. I think in the states, but there's a fast food chain here called Harvey's, and that's where I got yeah, my Harvey's. first. Yeah. First taste of entrepreneurship that didn't last very long and <laughs> well, not entrepreneurship working. <laughs> I know I um I actually got into entrepreneurship because I was staying at home with my our kids. I we had mm. made the decision together that I would stay home. I grew up in a single parent home. My mom had died when I was very young. My dad had two working parents and we had decided that we didn't want our kids growing up with babysitters like we had. So entrepreneurship and in this case, network marketing at the time allowed me the opportunity to be able to work from home, but still be able to bring in some extra money on the side. That's great. That's great. And and today with the internet and just all the technology, it, it creates a lot more opportunity for that, for a, a, a business owner to have a build and have a wonderful successful profitable business and still have more balance in their life so it's it's great my last my last company that i worked for i had to commute an hour each way every day five days a week i did that for six years right and so it's that's a just lot a of time. horrible way it's a horrible waste of time like i try to make the most of it like i listen to <laughs> podcasts or whatever but it's it's yeah so I can't remember who said it to me but it was a very long time ago so it was probably back like when you had CDs and things like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. somebody told me that they had a long commute, but they used that time to gain almost a university level education because yeah. they would, you know, they had CDs courses. I don't think podcasts were back then, but, you know, they spent that time in the traffic, learning, yeah. growing, you know, listening to great speakers like Jim Rohn, Bob yeah. Proctor, all of those types of people. And they said, I basically got a university education while sitting on the highway. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, and I took that approach. It reminds me, I think Tony Robbins has a, has a saying, it's called, he calls it net time N E T no extra time. So it's, it's when you're doing your chores around the house and you're listening to, you know, audio books and, and educating yourself. I did something very similar, which is, you know, I've been in marketing for a long time. And I was the chief marketing officer at this agency. And so I would listen to these amazing podcasts about marketing and I would bring these ideas into the work that I did just as a result of the podcast and the commute. So in, the, in some ways, the commute was a part of the success of the agency that I, I helped to grow. So there you go. <laughs> One of the amazing things about hosting a podcast is I get to learn so much from the guests that I have on my show. Yeah. And the audience knows this. Every once in a while, I pick certain guests because there's something I want to learn about. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. I mean, I, I'm the same way. I just had a, I'm a, I have a podcast myself and I brought on an expert in agency finance. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I know agency marketing. This guy knows agency finance and he, he has a whole business wrapped around it. I learned so much in this podcast. It was fantastic. I feel like I, you know, I've got a, like a, and an MBA in agency finance. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know, I know the feeling. 
Well, we are going to shift gears here, Corey, because uh -huh. I do want to talk about escaping founder-led right. sales. I think you and I have enough entrepreneurial experience that we could go anywhere we wanted to and have an intelligent conversation. But we promised the audience in yeah. the title of this show, Escaping mm -hmm. Founder-Led Sales. So I think we're going to transition into that to right. make sure that I keep my word to my audience today. So, Corey, go I'm going to let you loose. Mm -hmm. And I want you to talk about it and, and just yeah. really share how, you know, how can you go from being that founder led sales to actually having sales teams and being able to let go of that? Sure. So I'll share with you sort of my, my story that is the backdrop or the context for why I wrote this book and why, why it really does make a positive impact. So I've, I have about 17 years in the agency space. I started after my, I got my MBA from USC here in Los Angeles, and I went into a business development or a sales role at an agency that sold um, PPC and SEO to enterprise level businesses, large companies like Hyundai and Lululemon and Remax and the Men's Warehouse, all these things. And the the founder of this agency was a graduate from Harvard Business School. And if you're yeah, and if you're in the if you're in the United States, even if you're not, you probably know that Harvard Business School, like one of the benefits of going to HBS is they have you get you get part of you're all of a sudden a part of a very high quality network of other graduates. And so the way that we grew this agency was that the CEO, the HBS founder, would reach into the network and he had a direct line to the CMO of this business and the CEO of this business and these very, very successful business people. And as a result of those relationships, I on the sales team, we'd get these very warm introductions and we'd close the deal. And we grew the business, you know, many, many millions and it was a you know a big success. The next agency I worked for was also led by a founder who was charismatic, had a great network. This time he was the ex CEO of MySpace, the the social network. If you remember that that, that platform, right? And I never actually used it. <laughs> you never actually used it? Oh wow, you're like one of the few. <laughs> well, it's probably because I was up in rural Canada. It's not like we had proper internet or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, I I hear you. I, we were we were all back on the on the dial up back in those days, but but he the way that the way that MySpace works is they make money from advertisers. Big advertisers would would spend money on 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 that platform, and so he had in his cell phone he had a direct line to all the big advertisers. Well, guess how he grew his agency? He reached into that same pool. I at the time I was running a sales team, and and would get these really warm leads, and we'd close them, and we'd grow the agency. And by this time, I was like, you know, eight, eight, nine years into my agency experience. And I came to believe that the way that an agency was built was that you have a charismatic founder that's really well connected and they work their network and that's how you grow. And it wasn't until I joined an agency called Scorpion, my last in-house role. And I found something different, which was a six person sales team where the phone would ring, the salesperson would pick up the phone and in about 30 minutes, they'd hang up the phone and ring a gong that was on the middle of the sales floor, a big metallic gong, because they had just closed a one call close. <laughs> and what, what the, the dynamic there was that we were at the time focused exclusively or semi exclusively on servicing attorneys. We had a ton of attorney, like you know, almost you know, five, 600 attorney clients, and other attorneys would hear about us, whether through you know, advertisements or whatnot, and they would call into the sales floor. And they would commit to a 12 month engagement with this, with this company. And the funny thing is that they didn't know who the founder was. They didn't care who the founder was. It wasn't part of their purchase decision. What they cared about is as an attorney working with an agency who understood the specifics of marketing a law firm that was a specialist an expert had a lot of authority and a lot of evidence that they were truly experts. And as a result of that positioning, they were, they were committing. And so the big difference there was that Scorpion had this great positioning and this this reputation in this one vertical market. And as a result of that, obviously the founder was not involved. So that led to us taking what we did really well in the attorney or law firm market. And then we went to home services, which is plumbers, electricians, roofers, and we built a separate business unit 
um, specifically targeting that vertical. And we did the same thing with franchise and then medical practices. And so I've taken that that success. We grew it, as you said, eight eight times in five years. We went from 20 million to 150 million and you know, you know, massive success there. And now that I've, I've stepped back from that role, I've stepped into more of an entrepreneurial role. I'm an agency coach and consultant. Got a, you know, I'm a coaching and training program that I'm building. And the work that I do is helping generalist founders. So founders of agencies who have taken more of a generalist approach. And this is a generalist it means that they work with businesses of all shapes and sizes and they kind of do whatever they need. And as a result of that, they're tied to sales. So there's three things that causes a founder to be stuck in sales. And I'll talk about what those three are. Maybe this resonates with your audience. Maybe they see themselves in some of these things. We'll see. First one is that they lack a focus in who they work with. They, they work with businesses of all shapes and sizes. And as you mentioned that earlier, Kim, you know, as a result of that, as the founder, you're able to navigate that sales conversation with a prospect. Maybe on one call, it is a retail organization. Maybe the next phone call, it is a hospital. Maybe another, you know, conversation, it is a CPA, right? So you're able to navigate those conversations. But when you bring in a salesperson, they're not going to have the skills or the context to be able to do that effectively, right? So a lack of focus ties the founder to sales. That's number one. Number two is watered down positioning. When you are a generalist, you're serving businesses of all shapes and sizes. The way that you position your service, your, your business, your company tends to be rather, like I said, watered down, which means ultimately the thing that makes you special and unique is very hard for your buyer, target buyer to see and to understand. They just, they can't, they can't get it because you're trying to be too broad. And as a result of that, the markets don't see your specific value. They don't, they don't, they don't, they can't get it. Number one, number two, you end up competing on price. And then the worst one, I think, is you lose good opportunities to lesser firms, firms that don't deserve it, but they outmarketed you, they outpositioned you, right? And so when you have watered down positioning, you really have to depend on that founder to do, you know, the 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 the, the personal brand, the platform they've built, the relationships that they have, whether it be through HBS or through you know, EO, Entrepreneurial Organization, or Vistage, or whatever platform that people have their networks, they, they're they sort of stuck being the spokesperson for the brand. That's, that's number two, is having watery positioning. And then number three is not having enough of a sales pipeline or a way to generate sales pipeline when the founder is not directly selling. So if the set founder steps away, and the sales team is like, well, what do we do? You know, the phone's not ringing. How do we, <laughs> what are we supposed to do here? If you don't have a strategy in order to do that uh, and uh, build pipeline to build demand for your services, that always brings the founder back in. So it's lack of lack of the, the strategy to build pipeline. So when you have all three, a lack of focus, watery positioning and, and no strategy, the founder just gets sucked right back into the, the 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 sales role they have they're stuck there and you could imagine Kim what to do differently which is to do the inverse of those three things <laughs> uh you know it was funny a, a few years ago i was looking at you know hiring a salesperson mm. and i erroneously thought that i could just find a salesperson and they would do what i do as an entrepreneur they'd go right. out they network they generate leads they convert those leads and we'd all be happy and I would pay them well to do that. <laughs> right. I, I found out really quickly that that's not how it works. I have to mm. supply all the leads or the company yeah. has to supply right. exactly. all the leads. Exactly. And Which is you. <laughs> I might have to do all this work to generate the leads. I might as well just do the call and close them. Right. <laughs> right. Keep, keep the commission. <laughs> I realized, like, I, and that was such a shock to me because, mm. like, I was thinking, you know, that salespeople could actually, like, do the whole sales process right. from right. start right. to finish. But, right. Yeah, that was the reality a is, yeah, the reality is, I think there's some studies on this that say that 80% of the sale, the buyer is through 80% of the buying process. 
by the time they talk to a salesperson. In other words, they've done the online research. They, if you have a podcast, they've listened to your podcast. If they, if you have a book, they've read your book. Like all of these things happen before they actually talk to your sales team. And so if you don't have any of that, your, your sales team doesn't get the opportunity to have that conversation. So one thing I was thinking about, Corey, mm. so here I am now I am audience. I don't have the links for you yet, hopefully within the next couple episodes, but in June, and this will be aired at the end of April. So in June, I am going to be hosting a masterclass on the create method to write a book that converts readers into clients. So I, we're still building out some of the infrastructure and it's, it's a month and a half away, but I will soon have the link for you audience to be able to sign up for it. It's a free masterclass. But one of the things that we're talking about is, you know, to start to do these and then, you know, where are we going to take it from here? How do we automate it? You know, when we're starting to bring in enough leads that, you know, I can no longer, you know, do it all, then we can start looking at, you know, so how how do you transition? So once you've got those three things in place, because I fully agree. I mean, to be honest, any business needs to have those three things in place to begin with. If you really want to be successful, no matter really what kind of business you are, because if you are a generalist, you're right. Everything's based on price and the price don't go up and go down. Right. And yeah. Yep, and it's only going down. <laughs> well, Sorry. not if you position yourself. Not if you, you position leave. yourself. Exactly. That's that's it. Yeah, you can get out of that trap if you if you position yourself as an expert. That's right. So once you have those things in place, and like you're in a situation where I am, where I will be starting to generate leads, mm-hmm. how do you start to to build out that sales team? Yeah. So once you have focus in a vertical market meaning you have a very specifically de- you know, specific and de- defined market that you're targeting. Everything becomes, by the way, everything becomes much easier when it comes to marketing because you know yes. who you're targeting, what what to, what content to write, which shows to produce and all those things, right? Then when you, after you have the focus, then you do the positioning work, which is creating a way for you to distinguish yourself from all the other alternatives in the market. And you need positioning, you need messaging and a point of view. And I'm really a big believer in the power of a point of view. It's only, it's only then that you can do some, some, some lead gen acquisition strategies that are specific to your point of view and your messaging and your focus. But to answer your question, as a result of the focus, you, you, you're able to develop more of a productized approach to your sales. So you're selling a specific service with a specific outcome, with a specific scope. And as a result of that, there's a lot more, a lot less variation and variables that the salesperson has to deal with. If you do a lot of the pre-selling in the content that you're creating, and you're on your website, it's, you know, this is our program. It's the create method, you know, accelerator or whatever you're calling it. Ooh, At that, like that. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> you're able to when somebody puts out a delicious word or two, I yeah. have to write that thing down. <laughs> yes, I love it. <laughs> you're able to take out the variability and you also increase the 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 repetition in the sales process. So you can bring in someone typically the, the fastest way, typically the, the the way that a lot of agencies do this is they may bring someone up through the organization who maybe is previously focused on servicing clients and actually fulfilling on this product over time, they're typically a great person to bring into sales because they're the ones that are going to tell firsthand the prospect or the prospective client what to expect because they've they've known it and they've worked with existing clients for a period of time. That typically works really well. Another way that you could bring up a salesperson or, or bring in a salesperson is by finding someone who's already doing a very similar sale, maybe not for a direct competitor, but for someone for someone who can demonstrate that they understand both the the product that they're that you're selling as well as the audience. You have someone who can has experience in selling similar product to a similar audience that allows you to bring get up to speed much quicker than if you brought in someone who's never done sales and doesn't is not familiar with your service. So when it comes to something like that, yeah. Um, You know, just these are just questions that come through. Yeah. You know, are you are when you start bringing on like your first couple of sales people, like especially like Mm -hmm. in a situation like mine, like I'm not a huge company to begin with, right? So, 
you know, I may not be able to really do a huge salary. Like, is that going to be a limiting factor? Or are there people out there, you know, who thrive on the commission? Because with the packages we sell, the commission would be pretty sweet. Sure. And so the way that typically speaking that you structure, I recommend structuring a sales uh, compensation is at least to start is 50-50 where you have something that's called on target earnings, which is what they what they should expect to make if they are successful in hitting their quota. And their quota is in your case, you know, sell X amount of courses per month. That's 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 your expectation. And we're gonna give you the training, the tools, and so on and so forth to do that. So let's just say for round numbers, that is fifty thousand dollars a year. Like that, that's how much money they should expect to make once they're fully ramped. Fifty percent of that could be salary, and fifty percent of that should be made up on the variable comp, you know, comp, which is the commissions. So you're, as a business owner, you're really only on the hook for 25K, you know, just over 2K, 2K per month. And as soon, as long as they're meeting expectations, they're going to get to that 50K on target earnings based on their performance. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're going to switch gears here because you are an author and I need to make sure I ask you the question that every author that comes <laughs> to the show gets asked. So are you ready, Corey? I'm ready. Let's do this. Okay. What? Well, first of all, take a moment to introduce your book and let the audience yeah, know what it's about. This book is called Anyone, Not Everyone, and it is the proven system to escape founder-led sales. So came what we... Yeah. So what we've been talking about, and it also it's the, I'm going to see if I can do this. It's the agency edition. <laughs> and okay. so the reason why I did that, I obviously have a background in agency, but this is a problem. As you said earlier, you mentioned that businesses of all shapes and sizes can struggle as generalists, right? And so I had to get really clear on who I was focusing the contents of the book on. The first early draft of the book, it was for general businesses. And I got feedback from agency owners who I have as clients. They're like, there's not enough examples in the book about agencies. And it'd be great if there was. I was like, okay, I need to drink my own Kool-Aid and actually (laughs) focus the book on the specific buyer that I'm trying to influence with the book. And so in any event, the book is my five-step method for going from a generalist to a vertical market specialist. And vertical market meaning my approach is to identify a specific type of industry or, or a niche that you can focus your business on and then do the positioning and, and, and so on and so forth. Nice. Okay, yeah. here comes the question. What was the good, the bad, and the ugly about writing, editing, and publishing that book? Okay. The good, the bad, and the ugly? Is, you, is that was that the prompt? So the good is it's done. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that one a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple of things I think I did that was helpful. Well, number one is I did a round of beta reading, which means I did an early draft and then I put it out to the people that I wrote the book for. A handful of people raised their hand and said, yeah, I'll read the book and I'll come back. Um, that was really helpful because it made it a much better book. I also hired a really fantastic editor. And the way, the way I found this person is that I went into other books that were written that were very successful for the same industry that I'm targeting. And I found out who the editor was. That's who I contacted and said, hey, can I hire you? <laughs> and so that was really helpful. She made the book like a thousand times better. And then I, I hired really great experts with it as it relates to just continue, you know, another editor, a proofreader, which was great. And then a, a, a cover designer. Like I didn't do this on Etsy. I hired a professional, not Etsy, but uh, Fiverr. And and Fiverr is fine, but I was, I was really particular about that. And so all of those things are, were, were good, good moves for me. I think the, the hard part uh, for me was it took, it took a long time for me to write it because <laughs> I, you know, i I'm not a professional author, um, but I really wanted to bring a book into the world. And so the, the way that it worked is I joined accountability groups. And I did that for a little bit. And I just committed ultimately to writing for two to three hours a day, sometimes on the weekends. And I just I just went through the process. But it was it was sort of, I call it the long and expensive way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> what was some of the results that you've seen from releasing the book in terms of your business? Yeah. So I've released it 
nine days ago. And oh, it's a new yeah, baby. I'm a new baby. And so as a result, I, my, my calendar has been full of new sales opportunities. We hit the bestseller list across three different Amazon categories. We have over 50, thank you, over 50 five-star reviews as so we did a whole launch squad, whole thing. So a lot of just a lot of credibility and authority as you talk about in my, in my space, which is great. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, Corey, we are out of time. So what I would love for you to do is to share a, a final thought with us. And then, you know, for those who have heard this and saying, man, like I got to switch things up, how can mm -hmm. they connect with you? That's great. So first I'll talk, I'll talk about the connect. So you can go to my books website, anyone, not everyone and download a free audiobook version of the book right away. You can go there right now and start listening to it. There's also an online workbook and worksheets and so on and so forth. It's my gift to you and your listeners. So that's number one. Number two is uh, my, my advice. This will not shock you, Kim, but it is to <laughs> <laughs> that the best way to cut through the noise in the marketplace is to become a specialist in a specific vertical market. That's my... Yeah. That's my experience. That's my, that's what I teach. And so if you're struggling with cutting through the noise and struggling with founder led sales, start by focusing, trying to identify a, a vertical market that you could specialize in and become the best in the world at solving a, a challenging problem for them. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Corey. Oh, I thank love you, Cam. I appreciate it. Yeah. I love the opportunity. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Audience, where do you go from here? If you are watching on YouTube, you're going to see a thumbnail come up for episode 498. Three sentences that turn any discovery call into a high ticket sales opportunity. If you are listening on your favorite podcast app, today I will not make you scan back 60 episodes. Uh, about eight. So you don't have a long finger glide this time. <laughs> but it's another conversation that's just really going to help you take your business to the next level. Thank you so much for listening today. And we will see you on the very next episode. Bye now. You've been listening to the Author to Authority Podcast. The extraordinary word ninja, Kim Thompson Pinder, has helped over 200 entrepreneurs, professionals, speakers, and coaches write and publish their books that have become incredible marketing tools for their business. And many of those have gone on to become Amazon best-selling authors and have used their books to land high-level clients and get on big stages. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at www.author2authoritypodcast.com. See you next time.